Section 18 of Pitt by Archibald Primrose, Lord Roseberry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13, Part 1, Fall of the Government. The Union was considered a great triumph for Pitt, but it was the cause of his immediate fall. He was anxious not to delay an instant in pushing forward the large and liberal policy of which the Union had only been the prologue. The Act of Union received the royal assent on the 2nd of July, 1800. At the first cabinet, September 30th, 1800, after the summer recess, Pitt developed his Irish policy. It included the substitution of a political in lieu of a religious test for office, a commutation of tithes, and a provision for the Catholic and dissenting clergy. Pitt had now to learn that in choosing a successor for the impracticable Thurlow, he had managed to find an even more treacherous colleague. Loughborough, as he sate at council with him, had already betrayed him. During this month of September, while staying at Weymouth, the Chancellor had received a confidential letter from Pitt with reference to these different points, and had at once handed it to the king, whose prejudice on this subject had already been revealed in connection with the Fitzwilliam episode. Thus fortified, the Chancellor at the Cabinet of the 30th of September proclaimed his virtuous scruples. The question was adjourned for three months, during which time it was hoped that the good man would reconsider his objections and prepare a complete measure on tithes. Loughborough had no idea of thus wasting his time. He spent this interval in working on that royal conscience of which he was the titular keeper. He sought the congenial alliance of Auckland, a valuable accomplice, not merely on account of remarkable powers of intrigue, but as brother-in-law to Moore, Archbishop of Canterbury. That prelate was now stirred by some occult inspiration to address a letter of warning to the king. Stuart, the primate of Ireland, was moved by a simultaneous impulse to exert his pastoral influence on his sovereign. Pitt was undermined. His colleagues began mysteriously to fall away. Chatham and Westmoreland, Portland and Liverpool, commenced to side against the Catholics in a cabinet which had been supposed to be unanimous in their favor. In January of 1801, the mine was sprung. At a levee in that month, the king stormed audibly against the proposals which neither the first minister nor the cabinet had laid before him. He sent Addington the speaker to remonstrate with Pitt, who indeed could not have failed to hear at once of the scene at court. Pitt immediately addressed a statement of his policy to the king, tendering his instant resignation if he were not allowed to bring forward these different plans as government measures. The king, in reply, begged him to remain and be silent. Pitt at once resigned, and the king, with apparent anguish, acquiesced. The parting honor that he awarded his minister is notable. He knew that it was of no use to offer Pitt money or ribbons or titles, so he began a letter to him, My dear Pitt, a circumstance which throws a little light on the character of both men. The transaction has brought bitter censure upon Pitt. It is not easy to see why. What more could he do? What war is to kings, resignation is to ministers. It is the ultima ratio. He was, perhaps, open to censure for not having himself prepared the king at an earlier stage of the proceedings for the projected policy, instead of leaving it to others with a hostile bias. But a minister who had served George the Third for seventeen years may be presumed to have understood the king's times and seasons better than any retrospective intelligence. It must be remembered also that after the adjournment in September to promote union in the cabinet, he was obliged to wait in order to speak on behalf of a united government. Further, it may well have been that from his knowledge of the king, he thought that the best chance of obtaining his consent 
was to lay before him a completed measure and not a projected policy. Nor could he foresee the black betrayal of Loughborough. It is not, however, necessary to dwell on the charge of negligence, for the real accusation is much graver than one of negligence. It is one of treachery. The accusation, so far as it can be ascertained, for it is vaguely and diffusely expressed, imports that Pitt held out hopes to the Irish Catholics by which he secured their support to the Union, and that, instead of fulfilling these pledges or doing his best to fulfill them, he resigned, a mock resignation which he endeavoured to recall. But when and how were these hopes held out? There is absolutely no trace of them, none at least of any cabinet authority for them, Cornwallis and Castlereagh were indeed strongly pro-Catholic. What they did on their own responsibility is not known, nor is it now in question. But the most recent and the best informed of historians of the Union, and the most hostile to Pitt, expressly admits that it is, in the first place, quite clear that the English ministers did not give any definite pledge or promise that they would carry Catholic emancipation in the imperial parliament, or make its triumph a matter of life and death to the administration. On two points only did they expressly pledge themselves. The one was that as far as lay in their power, they would exert the whole force of government influence to prevent the introduction of Catholics into a separate Irish parliament. The other was that they would not permit any clause in the Union Act which might bar the future entry of Catholics into the Imperial Parliament, and the fourth article of the Union accordingly stated that the present oaths and declaration were retained only until the Parliament of the United Kingdom shall otherwise provide. The actual hopes held out were these. Castlereagh, on returning from London in 1799, where he had gone to gather the sentiments of the cabinet on the Catholic question, had written to Cornwallis that he was authorized to say that the opinion of the cabinet was favorable to the principle of relief, though they did not think it expedient to make any public promise or declaration to the Catholics or any direct assurance to the Catholics, but that Cornwallis would be justified so far as the sentiments of the cabinet were concerned in soliciting their support. And in his speech of the 5th of February, 1800, Castlereagh had further said that an arrangement for the clergy, both Catholic and Protestant dissenters, had long been in the contemplation of His Majesty's ministers. These were the pledges. What was the performance? That at the very first cabinet held after the passing of the Union Bill, Pitt produced his policy which more than embodied them, that he urged it on his colleagues with all his influence, that the king learned it surreptitiously and opposed his veto to it, and that Pitt thereupon promptly and peremptorily resigned. It is difficult for the most acute critic to perceive what more he could have done. It was impossible to convince or compel the king. His mind was too fixed and his position too strong. But it is urged that had Pitt insisted, the king who had given way to him before would have given way to him again. The answer is simple. He did insist, and the king did not give way, and would never have given way. For in this case, unlike the others, George the Third was convinced that he would incur the personal guilt of perjury under his coronation oath, and he knew that he would be supported in his resistance by the great mass of his subjects. Under the strain of this agony, for it was no less, torn by the separation from Pitt and by the pangs of his conscience, his mind once more gave way. The new ministry was already formed, and so, clear of all suspicion of interest, Pitt allowed the king's physician to soothe his old master's shattered mind by the assurance that the Catholic question should never more be raised by him in the king's lifetime. The promise was natural. George III was old and breaking fast. Two years later he was, in fact, at the point of death. The promise would probably not long be operative. 
but it has been insinuated that this was a mere renunciation on Pitt's part of a high principle in order to retain office, and that he was only too glad to be rid of an embarrassing pledge by a resignation which he hoped in this way to recall. Those who take this somewhat paltry view omit to state that Pitt's successor was appointed, that he himself declined to lift his finger to return to office, and promoted in every way the strength and efficiency of the government that replaced him. Facts of this kind can, of course, be always dismissed by a knowing wink or a sarcastic smile, but it is not possible even thus to dismiss the letter written late in December 1801 by Bishop Tomline. The bishop tells his correspondent with a groan that he has just had a long conversation with Pitt, who had told him that he looked forward to the time when he might carry Catholic emancipation, and that he did not wish to take office again unless he could bring it forward. Upon the Catholic question, our conversation was less satisfactory. He certainly looks forward to the time when he may carry that point, and I fear he does not wish to take office again unless he could be permitted to bring it forward and to be properly supported. This, the striking testimony of a most reluctant witness with regard to Pitt's innermost views, ten months after he had resigned and given his pledge to the king, must convince all those who are capable of conviction that Pitt's Catholic policy and consequent resignation were not less steadfast and straightforward than the rest of his career. It seems also clear from this significant narrative that Pitt's promise to the king was given under the persuasion that the king had not long to live, though George the Third survived his great minister just fourteen years. So much for human computation. On the other hand, if the king's death or madness could be attributed to the Catholic question, that reform would be indefinitely postponed. If the mooting of the question renewed the Regency discussions or produced a Regency, it would be too dearly bought. Compassion, nature, and policy pointed in the same direction. So obvious was the necessity of the pledge that Fox gave it at once and spontaneously on assuming office in 1806, though he had ten months before pressed the Catholic petition in a long speech, raising a fierce debate and division. I am determined, he said, not to annoy my sovereign by bringing it forward. This promise on the part of Fox, after harassing his rival with the question a short time previously, has always been held to be venial, and perhaps chivalrous, but given by Pitt it forms an item in this inscrutable impeachment. Another is this. The resignation was a sham because Pitt urged his friends to join and support the new ministry. The reason, however, is obvious enough. We were at war, and the first necessity of that state of things was to form the strongest possible government. It could not be strong, for the best men of Pitt's government were out of it, and the area of choice was in no wise extended. But it was the only possible government, and as it was by Pitt's act that the government of the country was so weakened, a heavy responsibility lay on him. His critics appeared to think it was his duty to have declared war on the new administration, to have harassed it with Catholic resolutions, to have bidden his friends hold aloof, and to have presented to France the spectacle of a political chaos, of fierce faction fights for power at the moment of vital struggle with a foreign enemy. Fox was impossible. No sane minister could have recommended as his successor in the midst of a war the fiercest opponent of that war, a leader of some fifty or sixty followers, at the moment when the most powerful administration available was required to a monarch who less than two years before had struck him off the Privy Council with his own hand. Pitt could only be followed by a government formed out of his own party, one which he could support, putting the Catholic question aside. The choice lay between making his successors strong or weak. His paramount duty was to the war, and he preferred to make them strong. It surely requires a lively prejudice to blame him for this, 
and the mere formulation of the charge implies considerable ingenuity. As for Catholic emancipation, that did not enter into the calculation, for if Pitt could not carry it at that time, it would have been mere folly for anyone else to attempt it. We may leave the whole transaction with the words in which Sir James Graham admirably summed it up. Mr. Pitt was prepared to do the right thing at the right moment, but genius gave way to madness, and two generations have in vain deplored the loss of an opportunity which will never return. Addington, the new Prime Minister, was a friend of the King's, and a sort of foster-brother of Pitt's, the son of the respected family physician who had prescribed colchicum to the elder and port to the younger Pitt, Addington carried into politics the indefinable air of a village apothecary inspecting the tongue of the state. His parts were slender and his vanity prodigious. A month after Pitt's resignation, but before he had given up the seals, some of his ardent followers, cognizant of his pledge to the king on the Catholic question, attempted a negotiation to keep him in office. Among them was Canning, who sang, Pitt is to Addington, as London is to Paddington. This was true, and the minimum of truth, but Addington did not see the matter in that light. The emissaries found him happy and immovable. After a short tenure of high office, the holder almost invariably thinks himself admirably fitted for it. But this was a strong case. Addington had never held political office at all, not an undersecretaryship, not a lordship of the treasury, and yet, before he had even received the seals, he felt himself a meet successor for Pitt. To counterbalance this deficiency in modesty, he had a handsome presence and warm family affections. It must also in fairness be laid to his credit that he was, heaven knows why, the favorite minister of Nelson. All that can be advanced on his behalf has been forcibly urged in the valuable vindication which Dean Milman addressed to Sir George Lewis. But it amounts mainly to this, that many country gentlemen preferred him to Pitt, because he had bland manners, and because they were not oppressed by his intellectual superiority. It is lamentable to think that if Pitt had to resign his power, it should devolve on Addington and not on Fox to succeed him. It is, however, pleasant to know that Loughborough received his due reward. The seals were taken from him. Still the wretched man hung on, he continued to attend the cabinet until Addington was forced to tell him plainly to be gone. He continued to haunt the court, with the result that on his death George the Third composed this epitaph for him. He has not left a greater knave behind him in my dominions. Pitt's retirement from office lasted three years. His first duty, like that of most ex-ministers, was to examine his private affairs and like most ex-ministers, with a distressing result. He was heavily in debt. He had to sell Hollywood. That Tusculum was heavily mortgaged and realized little surplus. His distress became known, for he was in danger of arrest. It was proposed to ask Parliament for a grant. The merchants of London offered him a free gift of £100,000. Pitt instantly put an end to such projects. He could not hold office again with the consciousness of such obligations. The king begged him to accept thirty thousand pounds from his privy purse. Pitt, with some emotion, declined this offer also. Finally, he condescended to take a loan of some twelve thousand pounds from a few personal friends. This discharged the most clamant and petty creditors, but it left a heavy balance and the loan was never paid off for nearly all the contributors refused to include it in the debts paid by Parliament at Pitt's death. And to the last day of his life, executions were threatened and even levied in his house. This is not altogether a pleasant picture. He had enjoyed fully ten thousand pounds a year for many years from his various offices. Although it is only fair to remember that at his death his salary as First Lord of the Treasury was no less than seven quarters in arrear. He had no expenses except those of homely hospitality, 
but his ideas of public and private finance differed widely. We are told that when he could not pay his coachmaker, he would order a new carriage as an emollient measure. And so with the other tradesmen. His household was a den of thieves. While he watched over the treasury like Sully, he conducted his own affairs like Charles Surface. In other respects, this year redounded greatly to his credit. He not merely gave an ardent support to Addington, but conducted the negotiations for a peace. By this he pledged himself to the preparation and defense of a treaty, any honor from which would entirely benefit his successor, and of which the blame only could devolve on himself, an episode surely rare in the annals of ex-ministers. The preliminary articles were signed on the 1st of October, 1801. We restored all the colonies that we had taken, except Trinidad and Ceylon. We agreed to give up Malta to the Knights of St. John. The fisheries in Newfoundland and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence were to be replaced on the same footing as before the war. Egypt, from which an expedition dispatched by Pitt had driven the French just after his resignation, was given back to Turkey. In return, the French did little more than withdraw from southern Italy. It was a treaty which could only be justified on the plea of imperious necessity. Much was conceded, for it was necessary to concede much. A prolonged armistice, for with Napoleon it could be little more, was absolutely needed. At any rate, it was hailed by the public with rapture, and it greatly strengthened Addington's administration. Grenville and Wyndham were, however, furious. They were joined by Spencer. Pitt's following was rapidly breaking up. Already Auckland, who was under every conceivable obligation to Pitt, and whose daughter Pitt had nearly married, had snapped and yelped at the heels of the departing minister. The new government had succeeded to Pitt's majority, which they maintained at a general election in 1802. He had indeed pressed all those whom he could influence to join or support the administration. Consequently, his personal following consisted only of those adherents, such as Rose and Canning, who would not take his advice. The years of Pitt's retirement were mainly spent at Walmer, with occasional excursions to London and Bath. From April of 1802 to May of 1803, he does not appear to have entered the House of Commons. In May of 1802, he received the greatest compliment that has ever been paid to an English statesman. Sir Francis Burdett had moved in indirect, and Nichols, the author of Some Paltry Recollections, a direct vote of censure on the late government. Both were rejected by immense majorities. But such rejection did not satisfy the House. A mere negative was insufficient. By an overwhelming majority against a minority of 52, it was carried that the Right Honorable William Pitt has rendered great and important services to his country and especially deserved the gratitude of this House. And immediately afterwards, there took place that spontaneous celebration of his birthday which was repeated for a full generation afterwards. It was for that first banquet that Canning composed the exquisite verses, The Pilot That Weathered the Storm. Under honors so unparalleled, Pitt could well remain in contented quiet at Walmer. That repose was greatly needed for his health, which, as has been seen, gave way in 1798, and now continued slowly declining to the end. He who had been at work by nine had become a late riser. He had ceased to answer letters, and the visits to Bath, commenced in October of 1802, became a frequent and periodical necessity. In September of 1802, he was again seriously ill, but his enjoyment of Walmer was intense. No disencumbered atlas of the state ever returned to country life with a keener relish, Shooting and laying out his grounds and the society of a very few old friends were his main amusements, and perhaps he was equal to no more. But in the summer of 1803, the apprehensions of a French invasion gave a novel employment to his active mind, 
for he construed his office of Lord Warden in its ancient and most literal sense. In August of that year he raised and drilled a volunteer corps of three thousand men. Amid the derision of his enemies and the apprehensions of his friends, he spent his days in feverish activity, riding and reviewing and maneuvering along the coast committed officially to his charge. He would not even go to London, unless the wind was in a quarter that prohibited a hostile landing. End of Section 18 Section 19 of Pitt by Archibald Primrose, Lord Rosebery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13, Part 2, Fall of the Government. Meanwhile, Addington and his colleagues drew their salaries with regularity, and so long as peace lasted, there was no objection to the process. Pitt, indeed, pricked his ears at Addington's budgets, but he had promised support as long as possible and remained silent rather than disapprove. It was not, however, in the nature of things that these relations could continue. Both men were surrounded by friends whose interest it was to set them against each other. Addington's followers saw that they could only keep their places under his administration and by the exclusion of Pitt. Pitt's followers were indignant that his post should be so inadequately filled. There were, moreover, little causes of irritation, want of zeal in defense, inspired pamphlets, the petty political smarts so easily inflamed into blisters by the timely assistance of toadies. The Whigs, of course, stimulated Addington with extravagant eulogy to prevent his thinking of making way for Pitt and the minister purred under the process. When, however, it became clear that there was no possibility of preserving peace with Napoleon, all eyes, even Addington's, instinctively turned to Pitt. Men so different as the Russian ambassador and Wilberforce spoke of ministers with undisguised contempt. Their weakness is lamentable, wrote the philanthropist. Si ce ministère dure, La Grande Bretagne ne durera pas, remarked the more caustic Waronso. In March 1803, Addington sent Dundas, become Lord Melville, to Pitt to propose that he should enter the ministry. Lord Chatham was to be Prime Minister, a recognition of primogeniture which may fairly be called extravagant. Addington and Pitt, joint secretaries of state, Pitt, however, never learned the post destined for himself, for Melville never got so far. Already, no doubt, sufficiently conscious of the absurdity of the proposition, he broke down at the beginning. Really, said Pitt, with good-natured irony, I had not the curiosity to ask what I was to be. It was profoundly galling to Addington to admit that Pitt could be more than his equal and might possibly be his superior but under stress of circumstance he went that length. In the ensuing month, April 1803, he renewed the negotiations in person. He offered the premiership to Pitt, who in exchange requested Addington, with cruel ignorance or heedlessness of the Prime Minister's opinion of his own qualifications, to return to the speakership, the duties of which he had so admirably discharged but as the speakership of the House of Commons was filled, he proposed to create a similar position for him in the House of Lords. Addington concealed his mortification, but begged that Grenville, Spencer, and Wyndham should not be included in the new cabinet, as they had spoken disrespectfully of himself. Pitt declined all exclusions. On this, the negotiation broke off, and with it all friendly relations between the principals. In the succeeding month, war was declared against France, and a few days later Pitt resumed his attendance in the House of Commons to defend that measure. His reappearance created a unique sensation. There were some 200 new members in the House of Commons who had never heard him, many of whom had never seen him. As he walked up to his seat, 
the feeling was irrepressible, and there was a cry of pit, pit, as if proceeding from the very helplessness of showing emotion in any other way. Whitbread and Erskine were heard with impatience, and then he rose, greeted with a renewed storm of acclamation. He spoke for two hours and a half, and the termination of his speech was received with round upon round of enthusiastic applause. But keen observers noted with pain his altered appearance and the sensible signs of his weakened health. The House immediately adjourned. On the succeeding night, Fox delivered a speech of three hours in reply, of which he says simply, The truth is, it was my best. There is little doubt that Pitt was at his best also, and that the fortunate members who sat in the House of Commons on the 23rd and 24th of May, 1803, heard the highest expression of English eloquence. During Pitt's speech, however, the reporters were unluckily excluded, and we have only a jejune abstract of Fox's. Our regret must be for ourselves, and not for the orators, as few speeches which have produced an electrical effect on an audience can bear the uncolored photography of a printed record. Some days afterwards, a vote of censure was moved on the ministry. Pitt interposed and proposed that the House should proceed to the orders of the day, for he would not censure and could not defend. He found himself in a mortifying minority of 34 against 275, a curious contrast to his triumph less than a fortnight before. The same motion was defeated in the House of Lords by 106 to 18. Such was the influence of the king, for in truth Addington represented nothing else. The strange contrast was between the moral and the voting power. A few days before this last division, Fox had proposed to accept the mediation of Russia. Hawkesbury, the foreign secretary, followed him and warmly opposed the proposition. Then Pitt rose and supported it, on which Hawkesbury at once assured the House that the government would readily agree to it. A month later, Addington brought forward a plan for a renewal of the income tax, which he had abolished on the conclusion of peace. On this, Pitt moved an instruction aimed at a distinction that Addington had drawn between landed and funded property on the one hand and all other forms of property on the other. Addington resisted this instruction with vigor. Sharp words passed between the minister and his predecessor. Pitt was beaten on a division by three to one. But the next day, Addington came down to the House and accepted Pitt's suggestion. His influence and authority in the House of Commons, writes Romilly, a strong opponent, exceed all belief. The ministry seems in the House of Commons, in comparison with him, to be persons of no account. In the session which began in November 1803, the predominance of Pitt was equally apparent. On the question of the volunteers, he made some drastic proposals, and the next evening the Secretary at War brought in a bill embodying them. But his relations to the government were becoming more and more tense. He declined, however, to ally himself with others in opposition, for he felt that his position was unique and must be maintained free from unnecessary complications. Grenville, always more extreme in hostility and anxious, some thought, to be independent of his late leader, entered into a definite alliance with Fox and pressed Pitt to do the same. Pitt steadily refused. This was in January 1804, and was, in fact, the last confidential communication that passed between them, for the interchange of letters in May was of a very different character. In February 1804, the king's mind once more gave way. Meanwhile, Addington's ministry was drawing steadily to an unlamented end. He became peevish and irritable. His majority began to waver. The Whigs, formerly so friendly, openly ridiculed him. And his chancellor, 
with the prescience then inherent in the woolsack, prepared for a change. In March, Eldon sent a communication to Pitt, and they met. In the ensuing month, Addington himself sent a message to Pitt, begging him to state through a common friend what could be done. Pitt haughtily replied that to the king alone, or to any person deputed by the king, would he make such a communication. This was Addington's last signal of distress. It occurred on the 17th or 18th of April, 1804. He now agreed to advise the sovereign to commission Eldon to see Pitt. On the 21st of April, Pitt sent a long letter to the king, which was put into the royal hands on the 27th. By that time, the division had taken place which was to end the ministry. On the 25th of April, their majority had shrunk to 37, a majority which many administrations would hail with pious rapture, but which betrayed so great a shrinkage as to convince Addington that his position was untenable. On the 26th of April, he communicated this decision to the king, and on the 29th to his colleagues. They concurred, and on the 30th, Eldon called on Pitt, by the king's orders, to furnish a written scheme for a new government. In reply, Pitt urged the claims of Fox. He had drawn up the scheme of a cabinet on a broad basis, which still exists in his autograph. He was to hold the treasury, but two out of the three secretaryships of the state were to be made over to Fox and Fitzwilliam, and Gray was to become secretary at war, while for Grenville he reserved the significant sinecure of Lord President. But he had also formally stated in a letter to Melville, dated on the 29th of March, 1804, that he could not force the king, recovering from an almost mortal malady, mental and bodily, to take as minister's persons he had so long proscribed. From various considerations, however, he wrote, and still more from this last illness, I feel that a proposal to take into a share of his counsels persons against whom he has long entertained such strong and natural objections ought never to be made to him, but in such a manner as to leave him a free option, and to convince him that if he cannot be sincerely convinced of its expediency, there is not a wish to force it on him. I should therefore, at the same time, let His Majesty understand distinctly that if, after considering the subject, he resolved to exclude the friends both of Mr. Fox and Lord Grenville, but wished to call upon me to form a government without them, I should be ready to do so, as well as I could, from among my own immediate friends, united with the most capable and unexceptionable persons of the present government, but of course excluding many of them, and above all Addington himself and Lord St. Vincent. This passage has been given at length because it succinctly defines Pitt's position in Pitt's own words. Once more his kindness for the aged king, slowly sinking into permanent darkening of sight and mind, was to prove a cruel obstacle in his path. The monarch himself received Pitt's letter with cold displeasure. He answered it in a note which betrayed the lingering influence of mental disease in its violence and want of courtesy. He at once saw the weak joint in Pitt's armor, the tenderness for himself, and loudly refused to have anything to do with Fox or Grenville, the mere proposal of their names was an insult. He even ignored Pitt's request for a personal interview. He could not get over the separation from Addington. Poignant, indeed, must have been the parting between these congenial mediocrities. At last, by the intervention of Eldon, a meeting with the king was arranged. The sovereign who had passed his former minister without notice the year before now received him with astute cordiality. But when they came to discuss the formation of the new government, they were both put on their mettle. The contest raged for three hours. Never was Pitt more urgent. He seems to have forgotten, in the heat of argument, the limitations which he had set himself in his letter to Dundas. 
but never was the king more stubborn. The contest ended in a compromise, which was in reality a victory for the sovereign. Grenville was admitted, but Fox excluded, though it was conceded that Fox might receive a foreign embassy. The monarch afterwards went so far as to say that he should prefer civil war to Mr. Fox. But the exclusion of the one confederate entailed the exclusion of the other, and so the king carried both points. The new minister at once communicated the result to Fox and Grenville. Their answers were characteristic. The lifelong enemy said that he did not care for office, but he hoped that his friends would join Pitt. The lifelong friend, colleague, and kinsman persuaded Fox's friends to stand aloof and stood aloof himself. It was the finest moment of Fox's life, and not the most auspicious of Grenville's. It is fair to say that Grenville might well be sensitive to the charge that would have been brought against him of having used Fox as a ladder to return to power, but from this imputation he was released by Fox himself. The very objection urged against Addington's administration was that the crisis required the strongest possible administration. Grenville's action rendered the new one deplorably weak. Had he entered it with Fox's friends, it would have been exceptionally powerful. A ministry of all the talents save one, and the admission of Fox himself must soon have followed. These considerations would make Grenville's action difficult to explain, but there is another circumstance which makes it wholly inexplicable. Exactly a year before, he had urged upon Pitt precisely the course which he now resented, and which Pitt now proposed to adopt. At the end of March, or the beginning of April, 1803, he went down to see his former chief at Walmer and had a conversation or a negotiation so elaborate that he himself wrote out and preserved an account of it. After this, he says, I suggested to Mr. Pitt the great advantage, which in my view of the state of the country, he would derive from endeavoring to form a government on a still more extensive foundation than that of which he had spoken, and from trying the experiment of uniting in the public service under circumstances of extreme public danger as the present, the leading members, not of the three parties who had been in his view, but of all the four into which public men were now divided. I stated the reasons I had for believing that with regard to the old opposition, this might be done by including in this arrangement only Lord Moira and Grey, and perhaps Tyranny, the latter in some office subordinate to the cabinet, and that Fox would be contented not to take any personal share in the government so formed. And on a subsequent day, I took occasion from that circumstance to renew this suggestion. It is clear, then, that the plan of forming a cabinet of all parties, excluding Fox, was so far from being repugnant to Grenville that it was his own proposal. It was supported by Fox's own wishes, it was at the moment the only practicable method of forming an efficient administration. Grenville, however, threw over his own plan and put every possible obstacle in the path of his old chief, who the year before had refused the premiership at the price of Grenville's exclusion. In this gloomy crisis of the fortunes of his country, he thought that the proper course was to hunt down the new ministry with inveterate hostility, so that he might succeed it at the head of a mongrel, dubious assortment of all the extremes of politics, and with the public men whom he had most bitterly denounced. But Pitt was not to be cowed. I will teach that proud man, he said, that in the service and with the confidence of the king, I can do without him, though I think my health such that it may cost me my life, as indeed it did. It must also be borne in mind as one of Pitt's greatest difficulties that the inclusion of Fox would have been profoundly repugnant to his own followers, both in Parliament and in the country. It would have been a coalition enough to try any faith. In Scotland, this feeling was strangely strong. Nothing less than Pitt's authority could have restrained it. 
Nevertheless, he persevered again and again in attempting to persuade the king to receive Fox. To all such efforts, however, if politics be indeed an affair of principle and not a game to be played, there is an obvious limit. There is, moreover, a point of honor involved. A minister may find it necessary to yield to political forces beyond his control and to change his policy. In doing so, he may ask for the admission to office of the representatives of that policy. It is a very different matter, however, for a minister pursuing consistently the policy which he has carried out for years to demand as an administrative necessity the inclusion of his principal opponent in a cabinet of which that opponent has been the inveterate enemy during its entire duration, who has criticized and resisted its every measure, tooth and nail, in letter and substance, in sum and in detail. Such a proceeding is lacking in common dignity and common sense. It is a surrender in the present and a reproach to the past. No hostile vote can carry a deeper condemnation than so self-inflicted a blow. In an acute crisis and for the pressing purpose of some supreme juncture, such a sacrifice may be made. But Pitt, who had administered government for eighteen years, not merely without Fox, but under the unrelenting fire of Fox's opposition, could hardly say in the 19th that he could not and would not enter office without him. Such a declaration carried to extremes would have been a confession of previous error and present impotence that would have gone far to prove he was not fit to be a minister at all. End of section 19《Section Twenty of Pitt by Archibald Primrose, Lord Rosebery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Fourteen: The End. So began Pitt's hundred days. For his second administration can only be compared to that second limited reign of Napoleon's after their triumphant dictatorships. His new cabinet was deplorable. So null was it that it was called the new administration composed of William and Pitt. For though some of its members afterwards attained eminence under the shade of Pitt, they displayed no such promise. There was Melville indeed, but Melville was in the House of Lords, and his intimacy with Pitt was much less close than in the former cabinet presumably since he had accepted a peerage from Addington and undertaken to be his emissary to Walmer. He was, moreover, to be the means of inflicting on his chief a mortal wound. There was Harrowby, who twice afterwards refused the premiership, and Hawkesbury, who held it for fifteen years as Lord Liverpool. But the first soon retired from illness, while the other had so far displayed little promise, and it was indeed something of a butt. Castlereagh was Pitt's only cabinet colleague in the House of Commons, and he in debate was disastrous. And there was, of course, the ordinary domestic furniture of Pitt's cabinets, the Portlands and Montroses and Westmorelands, the Camdens and the Mulgraves. There was also Pitt's brother, Chatham, an underrated figure. He was, no doubt, indolent and extravagant. As a general, he was a conspicuous failure. He was useless as the head of a department. He had no trace of the oratorical abilities of his father or his brother. But as a minister in cabinet, he was of singular value. Eldon, who was shrewd and in such a matter neither paradoxical nor biased, gave it as his deliberate opinion that the ablest man I ever knew in the cabinet was Lord Chatham. He sat apparently inattentive to what was going on, but when his turn came to deliver his opinion, he toppled over all the others. As a wretched general, a wretched administrator, a mute senator, and yet a cabinet minister. 
Chatham represented to the world a glaring example of Pitt's partiality. They could not know those qualities of counsel that preserved him, as they have many indifferent orators in the cabinet. Men forget that judgment is at least as much wanted in a government as agile fence, that the possession of eloquence by no means implies the possession of the other requisites of government, and that, for instance, any minister would prefer as a cabinet colleague Godolphin to St. John or Altrip to Brougham. There have been orators like Pulteney who have shriveled at the first contact with power. There have been statesmen like Cromwell who could not frame an intelligible sentence. Pitt's second government was endowed with neither a Cromwell nor a Pulteney, but curiously enough, although so universally derided, it contained no less than four future prime ministers, Portland, Percival, Liverpool, and Canning, while Harrowby might, had he chosen, have made a fifth. Pitt took his seat in the House of Commons as prime minister on the 18th of May, 1804. That same day, his supreme foe, the First Council, was proclaimed Emperor of the French. Shortly afterwards, Livingston, the American minister in Paris, escorted by Fox and Gray, brought Pitt a vague and dubious overture for peace, which came to nothing. This was the last of the rare occasions on which Pitt and Fox met in the same room. The minister's military and financial measures the latter including, as usual, another of the shocking demands of £500,000 to pay off debt on the civil list, he carried by majorities, varying from 40 to 50, in the same house which had furnished him in the previous session with the modest contingent of 33 followers. The session closed without incident on the 31st of July. In the recess, he continued to discharge his military duties, and in view of the army that Napoleon had assembled at Boulogne for the invasion of England, no precaution could be superfluous. His political preoccupations were scarcely less urgent. He resolved to gratify the king and increase his parliamentary support by the admission of Addington. Their mutual feelings were softened, and they returned to something of their early intimacy. Addington became Viscount Sidmouth and President of the Council. A place was also found in the Cabinet for his principal adherent, the Earl of Buckinghamshire, who had married Eleanor Eden, Pitt's only love. Another domestic incident occurred which was curious if not important. The Archbishop of Canterbury had long been dying, and Pitt was determined that his tutor, secretary, and friend, Bishop Tomlin of Lincoln, should be the next primate. The king was equally determined that the succession should not fall to that too acquisitive prelate. Having received early news of the archbishop's death, George the Third hurried across to the deanery at Windsor, the residence of Bishop Manners Sutton. The bishop was at dinner and was informed that there was a person outside who wished to see him and would not take a denial. He went out and found the king, who had come to offer him the primacy. The business was settled in a moment, and at the front door the sovereign went off chuckling as having outwitted Pitt. It is said, however, that when they met, language of unprecedented strength passed between king and minister it cannot, though, be doubted that the king was right. The royal speech at the opening of the session in January 1805 announced that we were at war with Spain, one of those measures founded rather on secret knowledge than on open rupture, which were then not uncommon and which were rendered necessary by the multiplicity of occult policies and subterranean agreements then prevalent in Europe. The British ministry was aware that a secret alliance had been concluded between Spain and France and determined to strike the first blow. Fox, who had been silent for the last four years and was to be silent ever afterwards on the question, thought fit now to urge complete Catholic emancipation 
as pressing and indispensable, but was easily defeated. The budget provided for enormous expenses. It became necessary to find 44 millions for the current year. The army figured for 18 millions and a half, the navy for 14 millions and a half, the ordnance for close on 5 millions, and 5 millions were taken for probable subsidies, though little or none of this last sum was spent. To meet these war estimates, Pitt proposed a new loan of 20 millions. Besides, therefore, continuing the existing war taxes, he had to find another million for interest. For this, he principally relied, in the spirit of modern finance, on an increase in the death duties. The supreme event of the session was the successful attack upon Lord Melville. That statesman was now first Lord of the Admiralty, where he displayed his wonted vigor and ability, but he had previously held for many years the office of treasurer to the navy, to which it was afterwards remarked he had always clung with strange persistence. A commission of naval inquiry had been sitting for three years and now presented a report on Lord Melville's conduct as treasurer. It showed that his paymaster had used the public balances for his private purposes. Although the public had not thereby sustained any loss, the commissioners rightly visited this proceeding with the severest censure. It was also admitted by Lord Melville that he had sometimes, as a confidential minister of the Crown, advanced monies from these balances for the purposes of secret service. The opposition alleged that he had used these sums to his own profit, but of this charge there was never the slightest proof, nor indeed any probability. Still, he had shown blamable laxity in a matter which requires the nicest precision of scruple. Whitbread brought forward in the House a series of resolutions condemning Melville's conduct. Pitt would have wished to meet them with a negative, but Addington hated Melville and would consent to no stronger amendment than a reference to a select committee. Even that motion was not carried. It was a case in which the House of Commons vindicated its independence. It passed beyond party leaders and party considerations and sought unbiased guidance. The speech of Wilberforce was therefore eagerly looked for. He was one of Pitt's dearest friends, but one also whom, in a matter of public morals, friendship could not sway. As he rose, Pitt bent forward and fixed an eagle glance of inquiry upon him. Wilberforce felt all that that mute appeal implied, but did not waver. He declared that he must vote for Whitbread. Not in his slave trade triumph did he hold a prouder position. The numbers were equal. The speaker, as he announced them, turned white as ashes, for the responsibility of decision devolved upon him. After a painful silence of many minutes, he gave the casting vote against the government. Then arose a shout and turbulence of victory, such as this generation has once at least witnessed, when senators behaved like schoolboys and passion ran uncontrolled. There were view hellos. We have killed the fox, shouted one sturdy sportsman with some confusion of idea. Pitt pressed his hat on his head, and it was seen that this was to conceal the tears trickling down his cheeks. Some unmannerly Whigs pressed up to see how he bore his friend's political death. But a little band of his younger followers rallied around him, and thus unconsciously encompassed, he moved out of the house. It was the greatest blow that he had ever received. Some have ascribed his death to Ulm, and some to Austerlitz, but if the mortal wound was triple, the first stab was the fall of Dundas. We can get over Austerlitz, he said to Huskisson at Bath, but we can never get over the tenth report.' 
Melville, of course, resigned at once. He was succeeded by an octogenarian member of his board, Sir Charles Middleton. Addington, who wanted the place for one of his followers, retired in dudgeon, and though this difference was patched up, his secession was only deferred. After the Easter recess, the attack was renewed. The report was referred to a select committee. Whitbread moved an address to the Crown, praying that Melville should be removed from the Privy Council. Pitt at first resisted, but at the request of Melville himself, erased his name before the motion could be put. As he made this announcement to the House, he almost broke down. Traces of this emotion hitherto so rare in him were not, indeed, uncommon during the short remainder of his life. The report of the committee was unfavorable, and after Melville had addressed the House of Commons from the bar, an impeachment was resolved upon. He was ultimately acquitted, but the divisions on the question of impeachment, in which Addington's friends voted strenuously against Pitt, produced Sidmouth's final resignation. An ex-premier is usually found, by any cabinet in which he may serve as an ordinary member, to be a fleeting and dangerous luxury. Addington was no exception to the rule. The fall of Melville was chiefly felt in Scotland. There he had long reigned supreme, with general popularity and good nature, by the exercise of a double patronage. While he had Scotticized India, he had Orientalized Scotland. He had imported into India a splendid staff of Scottish administrators. He had imported into Scotland the absolutism of a Gukawar or a Nism. When he fell, the air was cleared, and men who had sat in darkness under his shadow saw the light once more. The Prime Minister's arrangements to supply the places of Sidmouth, Buckinghamshire, and Melville were only temporary. He still clung to the hope of inducing the King to consent to the admission of Fox and Grenville and their friends, with that object he set out for Weymouth, where for hours he urged upon his sovereign every plea and argument for such an arrangement. But the king was obstinate. It was not necessary, he said. Pitt could do well enough without them. He knew, in fact, that in the last resort he could always rely on Pitt's pride, that Pitt would never resign on account of gathering difficulties or hostile coalitions, but had he yielded now, he might have saved Pitt's life. With a melancholy foreboding, the minister said, a fortnight before his death, I wish the king may not live to repent, and sooner than he thinks, the rejection of the advice which I pressed on him at Weymouth. For the burden fell now solely on the enfeebled shoulders of the dying premier, the brilliant chiefs of opposition might have relieved him of much. As it was, if Pitt has the gout for a fortnight, said Rose, there is an end of us, and so it proved. The minister was thus at bay, but never had he shown a richer conception or a greater energy of resource. He had determined to oppose to Napoleon the solid barrier of the European concert, for that purpose, he had been maturing a gigantic alliance which should employ the fleets and treasure of England and the vastest armies that Russia, Prussia, and Austria could put into the field. He commenced with Russia. On the 11th of April, 1804, a treaty was concluded at St. Petersburg. 500,000 men were to be arrayed against France. Great Britain was to contribute ships and men and money. On the 9th of August, Austria signified her adherence. This was the third coalition. Prussia ruled by covetous incapacities wavered and was wavering when the coalition was crushed. So she escaped that fall, but a worse fate awaited her. At this moment, August 1805, Napoleon was still bent on striking a mortal blow at England. 
he only awaited the fleet which was to give him command of the channel for the fatal twelve hours daily he gazed intensely at the horizon till the tidings came that his admiral had retreated into cadiz there was no time to be lost for he was well aware of the new league he instantly moved his collected legions to germany the empire which possessed the archduke charles preferred to oppose to him general mack a strategist of unalloyed incompetency an unvaried failure in a few marches napoleon cut off mack from austria and surrounded him at ulm and the first event in the history of the third coalition was the absolute surrender of thirty thousand of their choicest troops this was on the nineteenth of october at the end of october and in the first days of november there were rumors of it in london pitt almost peevishly contradicted them but on sunday the third of november came a dutch paper which pitt brought to malmesbury to translate and which told the worst he went away with a look on his face which never again left it but his spirit did not quail on the fifth of november a dispatch was on its way to vienna in which pitt made a supreme appeal to austria not to flinch he had already he said sent lord harrowby to berlin to urge the early activity of the prussian armies there seems at present every reason to hope that the mission will be effectual great as have been the pecuniary efforts which his majesty has made for the common cause he is ready still to extend them to such a farther amount as may enable those powers to bring an active force of from two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand men and his majesty has no doubt of being enabled himself to augment his own active force to not less than sixty thousand men with objects so paramount in view with such vast means in reserve these efforts could not fail and in a glowing sentence so like one of pitt's perorations that one can almost hear his voice in it he says that even should the enemy plant his standards on the walls of vienna he is sure that the ancient spirit of austria would still remain unshaken and undismayed and that napoleon would still have to encounter the concentrated energy of a great and loyal nation and the united efforts of powerful allies a few days afterwards the news was eclipsed by the tidings of trafalgar nelson had attacked with an inferior force the combined french and spanish fleets consisting of thirty-three ships of the line and seven frigates of these no less than twenty struck their flag but even this consummate achievement was overbought by the death of england's greatest warrior it is for this reason perhaps that trafalgar is inscribed as a victory in the museum of arms at madrid unto this day the nation was profoundly moved by the double intelligence but triumph predominated the minister himself once so equable when roused at night to read the dispatches so full of joy and sorrow could not resume his rest the day afterwards he was present at the annual dinner of the lord mayor the populace had forgotten ulm and could think only of trafalgar once more and for the last time they received him with acclamations and drew his chariot in triumph to the guild hall there his health was drunk as the saviour of europe pitt replied in the noblest the tersest and the last of all his speeches it can here be given in its entirety i return you many thanks for the honour you have done me but europe is not to be saved by any single man england has saved herself by her exertions and will as i trust save europe by her example that pageant was in some sort a state funeral for he was never seen in public again a month afterwards december seventh 
he set out for Bath. Austerlitz, the Battle of the Emperors, had been fought on the second. One emperor was in flight, the other sullenly sustained defeat. Their armies were scattered. A peace was being negotiated amid the shattered ruins of the coalition. Pitt alone remained. But even in the wreck of his life, his intrepid foresight survived. Nothing, he said, but a war of patriotism, a national war, could now save Europe, and that war should begin in Spain. Melville and Ulm had borne heavily on Pitt. Austerlitz killed him. He was at Bath when he received the news. Tradition says that he was looking at a picture gallery when he heard the furious gallop of a horse. That must be a courier, he exclaimed, with news for me. When he had opened the packet, he said, heavy news indeed, and asked for brandy. He hurriedly swallowed one or two drams. Had he not, says an eyewitness, he must have fainted. He then asked for a map and desired to be left alone. He had gout flying about. The shock of the tidings threw it back on some vital organ. From this day he shrank visibly. His weakness and emaciation were painful to witness. Still, he did not abate his high hopes or his unconquerable spirit. He wrote cheerfully to his friends. He was better but wanted strength. Bath was of no further use. He would return to the house which he had hired at Putney, a mansion still existing and locally known as Bowling Green House. There, in a spacious and sunny room, from which one may still look out on Pitt's green lawns and avenue of limes, he was destined to die. On the ninth of January, he set out home. So feeble was he that it took three days to compass the journey. He arrived at his villa on the twelfth. As he entered it, his eye rested on the map of Europe. Roll up that map, he said. It will not be wanted these ten years. On the 14th, Wellesley, just returned from his great proconsulate, had a long interview, the last, for no one again saw Pitt but his immediate family, among whom Rose and Tomlin may be included, and his physicians. He fainted indeed while Wellesley was in the room. That old friend felt it his duty on leaving Putney to go to Lord Grenville and warn him that Pitt was at the point of death. Wellesley found him drafting resolutions of censure and concerting the fiercest opposition to the minister. On learning the news, Grenville broke into a passion of grief. It is difficult to test the temperament of tears, but it is easy to believe that these were both bitter and sincere. Party hostilities were at once suspended. There was indeed nothing left to fight against. Fox displayed a generous emotion. Mentem mortalia tangunt, he said. The address to the Crown was agreed to and the House adjourned. As the Speaker and members were proceeding with this address to the Palace on the 23rd, January 1806, they learned that Pitt had died early that morning. From the time that he saw Wellesley, he had gradually declined. He could take little or no nourishment. Early on the morning of Wednesday, the 22nd, Tomlin had thought it his duty to warn his old pupil that death was imminent and to offer the last sacrament. Pitt declined, as he had not strength, but he joined earnestly in prayer. He threw himself, he said, on the mercy of God, and trusted that the innocence of his life might plead for him. The same thought which had solaced the last moments of the Emperor Julian. He then bade a solemn farewell to Hester Stanhope, the niece who had kept house for him, and who was to develop so fierce an eccentricity. To her he gave his blessing. Dear soul, he said, I know she loves me. All Wednesday night he was delirious. His wandering mind revolved round the mission of Harrowby, whom he had sent, as has been said, to fix the fickle energies of the court of Berlin, the last hope of Europe. He constantly asked the direction of the wind, 
East, that will do. That will bring him quick, he murmured. At midnight the end was near. At half-past four it came. A short time previously, with that strange recovery which so often precedes death, he said with a clear voice, Oh, my country! How I leave my country! After that last note of anguish, he neither spoke nor moved again. A motion was at once brought forward to provide a state funeral and a public monument in Westminster Abbey. It was agreed to by 258 to 89 votes. Fox, in spite of a personal appeal from Grenville, deemed it his duty to oppose it. Such an opposition was in the highest degree distasteful to a nature eminently generous. But after a parliamentary opposition of twenty years, he could not stultify himself by paying honor to Pitt as an excellent statesman. No one can blame such a course, though abstention had been perhaps less painful and more dignified. He had, however, an opportunity of showing the purity of the principle on which he proceeded. It was proposed to vote £40,000 to pay Pitt's debts, to award life pensions of 1200 a year to Lady Hester Stanhope, and of 600 a year to each of her two sisters. Never in my life, said Fox, did I give a vote with more satisfaction than I shall do this night in support of this motion. No wonder such a man had such friends. A month after his death, Pitt was laid in the abbey by his father's side, amid a splendid pomp of public grief. The statue of the father, said Wilberforce with fine feeling, seemed to look with consternation at the vault that was opening to receive his favorite son. What sepulchre, exclaimed Wellesley, who was also present, embosoms the remains of so much excellence and so much glory. The ministry, as Rose had predicted, crumbled instantly to pieces. Hawkesbury was content with the sink ports as his share of the great inheritance. Portland was not thought of. Castlereagh had the courage, but neither weight nor standing nor speaking power. The sovereign appealed to them in vain. They were unanimously of opinion that their headless body contained no principle of vitality. The king, without hope or resource, succumbed helplessly to fate. So was formed the ministry of all the talents, and it may be added all the incongruities. Fox and Addington, Grenville, and the Lord Chief Justice of England were the strange chiefs of this dubious fellowship. It is not now possible to discover the burning principles which had impelled these eminent men to fight Pitt to the death, for they at once abandoned the Catholics and proceeded with the war. In any case, their administration, after an inglorious year, came to a guileless end. Then succeeded a long government of which Portland was the first nominal head, and twenty years of much glory without, and utter darkness within. End of section 20section twenty one of pitt by archibald primrose lord rosebury this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fifteen part one character and position of pitt so passed pitt cromwell and napoleon yielded their breath amidst storms and tempests but no natural convulsion could equal the political cyclone that raged round that lonely bed at Putney. All Europe lay at the feet of the enemy. The monarchs whom Pitt had leagued together in a supreme alliance were engaged either in negotiation or in retreat. The Prussian minister, ready for either event, had also hurried to the conqueror's tent to secure his friendship and a share of the spoil there was not the vestige of a barrier to oppose the universal domination of Napoleon, but the snows of Russia and the British Channel. Well might Pitt, in a moment of despair, roll up the map of Europe. At home his prospects were no brighter 
he had to meet Parliament with Trafalgar, indeed to his credit, but with Nelson dead, with Ulm and Austerlitz as the results of his continental combinations, with a scanty and disheartening following. Arrayed against him and thirsting for his overthrow were the legions of Fox and Grenville, and the domestic circle of Addington. His friends had no conception of any resource that could save him. Rose and Long competed in dismay. Pitt, however, did not seem greatly to trouble himself. He had defeated a more formidable coalition before, and he believed in himself. His calculation was probably right. With health, he would have maintained himself. His last reception in the city showed that he had preserved or regained his popularity with the people at large. He had a working majority in Parliament, and though his colleagues of the cabinet were flaccid and null, he had a boundless resource in canning his political son and political heir. Fox was not to live long, and after his death, even had Pitt once more failed to induce the king to receive him as a minister, the long-desired administration of all the capacities must have been formed. Of the private life of Pitt there is not much to be said. There are constant attestations of his personal fascination in that intimate and familiar intercourse which was the only kind of society that he enjoyed. He seems to have liked that country-house life which is the special grace of England. We find him visiting at Longleat and Stowe, at Whitcomb and Dropmore, at Sissister and Wilderness, at Buckton and Shortgrove, at the villas of Hawkesbury and Rose, and Long and Dundas and Addington. Here we find him indulging pro pudor in a game of cards. Pope Joan and speculation or commerce, now relegated to children. In all these societies he seems to have left but one unfavorable impression. A high-born spinster who met him at Dropmore says, I was disappointed in that turned-up nose and in that countenance in which it was impossible to find any indication of the mind, and in that person which was so deficient in dignity that he had hardly the air of a gentleman. If not tropes, I fully expected the dictums of wisdom each time that he opened his mouth. From what I then heard and saw, I should say, that mouth was made for eating. This is a harsh judgment. On the other hand, one of the choicest ladies of the French aristocracy who met him during the Revolution expressed her delight in his grave and lofty courtesy, and long recalled the patient pleasure with which he heard French books read aloud. To the purity of his French she also paid a tribute. Butler records that his talk was fascinating, full of animation and playfulness. Pitt said of Buckingham that he possessed the condescension of pride. It was said of his own manners in society that he possessed the talent of condescension, than which, if it means that he made condescension tolerable, there is perhaps none more rare. Curiously enough, he seems to have preserved his boyish spirits to the end, Miss Wynne, when she met him at Dropmore and drew the crude portrait just quoted, records the competition of unearthly howls raised by Pitt and the other assembled statesmen chasing a bird out of the drawing-room which disturbed her rest and possibly gave her an unfavorable bias. And Sir William Napier, who, as a young ensign, first knew Pitt in 1804, has recorded the romp when he and the young Stanhopes and Lady Hester succeeded in blacking the Prime Minister's face with a burned cork. The struggle was interrupted by the arrival of Hawkesbury and Castlereagh, and Napier graphically records the change that came over their playfellow as he received them, how the tall, ungainly, bony figure seemed to grow to the ceiling, while the secretaries of state bent like willows before him. Few without these testimonies would have suspected Pitt of being addicted to those sports known to the present generation as bear fights. But it is certain that nothing could be more easy and familiar than the footing of that little set of people with whom he habitually lived, and who seemed to have been known among themselves as the firm or the gang. Chapter 
His friendship, although like all worthy friendship not lavishly given, was singularly warm and was enthusiastically returned. Nothing in history is more creditable and interesting than his affectionate and lifelong intimacy with Wilberforce, so widely differing from him in his views of life. Hardened politicians such as Rose and Farnborough were softened by their intercourse with him and cherished his memory to the end of their lives with something of religious adoration. This, indeed, was the posthumous feeling which he seems to have inspired more than any other person in history. Even Sidmouth, who had loved him little during the last luster of his life, shared this and boasted that he had destroyed every letter of Pitt's which could cause the slightest detriment to Pitt's reputation. Canning Pitt loved as a son. There is nothing more human in Pitt's life than the account of his affectionate solicitude and absorption at Canning's marriage. Canning's love for Pitt was something combined of the sentiments of a son, a friend, and a disciple. The usual epithet applied to him is haughty. A truer light is thrown by the conversation which is recorded to have taken place as to the quality most required in a prime minister. While one said eloquence, another knowledge, another toil, Pitt said patience. Rose, in a close intimacy, private and official, of twenty years, never once saw him out of temper. His family affections were warm and constant. His letters to his mother are pleasant to read. He was indeed the most dutiful of sons. His grief at the death of his favorite sister, Lady Harriet, and her husband, Mr. Elliot, was beyond description. His kindness to his oppressed nephews and nieces, the Stanhopes, was constant and extreme. The father who harassed them had long quarreled with him. It was truly remarked that he unselfishly made a great sacrifice and cheerfully ran a great risk when, after a life of bachelorhood, he took his niece, Hester, to keep house for him. She led him an uneasy life with her terrible frankness of speech, but he bore all with composure, and she repaid him with the rare devotion of that vain, petulant nature which fretted off into something like insanity. Once and only once he formed an attachment which might have led to marriage, though he liked women's society and is even said to have drunk a toast out of the shoe of a famous Devonshire beauty. But in 1796, his feeling for Eleanor Eden, the eldest daughter of Lord Auckland, went so far that he wrote to her father to declare his affection, but to avow that circumstances, which, however, he did not specify, made it necessary for him to renounce any idea of marriage. The obstacles, he declared, were decisive and insurmountable. Auckland reluctantly concurred, but urged that as a mark of good feeling he should receive the privy seal. To this suggestion Pitt did not listen. He broke off his relations with the Eden family, a privation which he sensibly felt. Two years afterwards the young lady married Lord Hobart, afterwards Lord Buckinghamshire. Lady Hester said that this nearly broke Pitt's heart, but Lady Hester's statements do not impress one with conviction. Lord Holland, also an indifferent authority on this subject, says that Pitt paid attentions to Miss Duncan, who was afterwards Lady Dalrymple Hamilton. But there seems no further confirmation of this statement. However, though we cannot imagine a married Pitt more than a married Pope, it is clear that he did seriously contemplate the married state, and cynics may remark with a smile that he afterwards showed a certain dislike of Lord Buckinghamshire and a reluctance to admit him to the cabinet, though other reasons might well account for that. His life was pure, in an age of eager scandal, it was beyond reproach. There was indeed within living recollection a doorkeeper of the House of Commons, who from some chance resemblance was said to be his son, but Pitt's features, without the intellect and the majesty which gave them life, lend themselves easily to chance resemblance and ignoble comparison. Raxall hints at a licentious amour, but even Raxall expresses his skepticism 
the austerity of his morals inspired many indecorous epigrams, but also a real reverence. His one weakness, it is said, was for port wine. We have seen that he was reared on port from his childhood, and when he arrived at man's estates, he was accustomed to consume a quantity surprising in those days and incredible in these. The habits of that time were convivial, but it is not till Pitt's health was broken that the wine which he took seems to have had more effect on him than a like measure of lemonade. Bishop Tomlin has left a memorandum stating that never before 1798 did he see Pitt the least affected by wine. Addington, when questioned on this point, declared that Mr. Pitt liked a glass of port very well and a bottle better. Sometimes, indeed, the speaker, who himself was decorously convivial, had to stop the supplies and say, Now, Pitt, you shall not have another drop, though Pitt's eloquence would usually extract another bottle. Addington, however, averred that never had he seen Pitt take too much when he had anything to do, except once when he was called from table to answer an unexpected attack in the House of Commons. It was then so clear that he was under the influence of wine as to distress his friends. One of the clerks of the house was indeed made ill by it. He had a violent headache. An excellent arrangement, remarked Pitt. I have the wine and he has the headache. We read of hard drinking at the Duchess of Gordon's of Thurlow, Pitt, and Dundas, galloping home after a dinner at old Jenkinson's through a turnpike, the keeper of which in default of payment discharged his blunderbuss at them, and of Stoddard the painter, being told by an innkeeper, as Pitt and Dundas rode off, I don't care who they are, but one of those gentlemen drank four and the other three bottles of port last night. But all this must be judged by the habits of that time and not of ours. When Scottish judges sat on the bench with their stoop beside them, when at least one viceroy of Ireland could die of drink, when Fox and Norfolk would, after a debate, get through a great deal of wine, and what this last meant by a great deal it is scarcely possible to compute, when the English clergy were said to have considered their cellars more than their churches, when a great Scottish patron only stipulated that the ministers whom he chose should be good-natured in their drink, when a university common room could only be faced by a seasoned toper, when Lord Eldon and his brother could drink any given quantity of port, it is hardly conceivable, if Pitt had been guilty of habitual excess, that Wilberforce should have been his constant host or guest at dinner. There is, however, little doubt that if he dined with a party now, it would be thought that he drank a good deal, and while the Tories said that he died of a patriot's broken heart, the Whigs averred that he died of port. But in this, as in so much else, it must be constantly reiterated that he must be judged by the temper of his own times and not of ours. He was tall and slender in appearance, the early portraits by Gainsborough represent a face of singular sweetness and charm. The last portrait by Lawrence, who only saw him a few weeks or months before his death, represents a figure of rare majesty with powdered hair. His hair, however, was untouched by time. It remained to the last of a chestnut hue, without a suspicion of gray. So much one gathers from a lock cut off by Bishop Tomlin on the day of Pitt's death, which survives in an envelope which still contains the powder. Of this picture, a replica was painted for the king and hangs in the great gallery at Windsor. One who had sat with him in Parliament and who survived until this generation said that he had a port wine complexion, but the most brilliant eye ever seen in a human face. Much the same description as is given of Sheridan's appearance. Hopner, who painted Pitt from the life for his colleague, Mulgrave, in 1805, gives him tints of this kind. As Wilberforce said on seeing Hopner's portrait, his face, anxious, diseased, reddened with wine, and soured and irritated by disappointments. Poor fellow, how unlike my youthful Pitt. Fox said that he could see no indications even of sense in Pitt's face. 
Did you not know what he is, you would not discover any. Gray thought otherwise, but Raxall agrees with Fox. It was not till Pitt's eye lent animation to his other features, which were in themselves tame, says Raxall, that they lighted up and became strongly intelligent. In his manners, Pitt, if not repulsive, was cold, stiff, and without sincerity and amenity, he never seemed to invite approach or to encourage acquaintance. From the instant that Pitt entered the doorway of the House of Commons, he advanced up the floor with a quick and firm step, his head erect and thrown back, looking neither to the right nor to the left, nor favoring with a nod or a glance any of the individuals seated on either side, among whom many who possessed five thousand pounds a year would have been gratified even by so slight a mark of attention. It was not thus that Lord North or Fox treated the Parliament. His nose, said Romney, was turned up at all mankind. How many a vote he and Peel and Lord John Russell may have lost by this shy self-concentration of demeanour, or how many have been gained by the sunny manner of Palmerston, or the genial face memory of Henry Clay, must remain a permanent problem for the student of politics and man. His action as a speaker, that might have been supposed to resemble the majestic stateliness which a later generation admired in Lord Grey, was vehement and ungraceful, sawing the air with windmill arms, sometimes almost touching the ground. Unfriendly critics said that his voice sounded as if he had worsted in his mouth but the general testimony is that it was rich and sonorous. Fox never used notes, and Pitt rarely. A specimen of these is given by Lord Stanhope. His eloquence must have greatly resembled that with which Mr. Gladstone has fascinated two generations, not merely in pellucid and sparkling statement, but in those rolling and interminable sentences which come thundering in mighty succession like the Atlantic waves on the Biscayan coast, sentences which other men have neither the understanding to form nor the vigor to utter. It seems, however, to have lacked the variety and the melody, the modulation of mood, expression, and tone, which lent such enchantment to the longest efforts on the least attractive subjects of his great successor. To Pitt's speeches, says a contemporary by no means prejudiced in his favor, nothing seemed wanting, yet there was no redundancy. He seemed, as by intuition, to hit the precise point, where, having attained his object, as far as eloquence could affect it, he sat down. This is high praise indeed, but it can hardly be believed that Pitt was never open to the charge of diffuseness. In those days, the leader stood forth as the champion of his party and stated every argument in a speech of exhaustive length. Private members had little to do but to cheer. It was, however, calculated as an almost certain matter of proportion that if Fox were three hours on his legs, the reply of Pitt would not exceed two. Butler says, not untruly, that as Fox was verbose by his repetitions, so was Pitt by his amplifications. Neither had before him the terror of the verbatim report and the coming specter of that daily paper in which the evening's speaking bears so ill the morning's reading. Had it been otherwise, they must have condescended to compression and probably to those notes which guide and restrain argument. Sheridan, indeed, said of Pitt that his brain only worked when his tongue was set a-going, like some machines that are set in motion by a pendulum or some such thing, but this opinion bears the stamp of a certain envy of Pitt's ready and spontaneous flow of speech felt by one to whom laborious and even verbal preparation was necessary. Lord Aberdeen, who was Pitt's ward and had heard all three, preferred the oratory of Canning to that of either Pitt or Fox. Sheridan made a more famous speech than either, but no criticism can now affect Pitt's place as an orator. Wilberforce himself, no mean orator, writing in 1825, spoke of the brilliancy of the speaking of that time when Broome and Canning and Plunkett were at their best, but said also 
that it was on a distinctly lower level than that of Pitt and Fox. The stupefaction produced by Pitt's slave trade speech on the greatest minds of the opposition has already been recorded. Dudley, the most fastidious of judges, breaks into enthusiasm in speaking of him. Fox did not seek to disguise his admiration. He said that although he himself was never in want of words, Pitt was never without the best words possible. His diction, indeed, was his strongest point. His power of clear, logical statement, so built up as to be an argument in itself, was another. And as a constant weapon, too often used, he had an endless command of freezing, bitter, scornful sarcasm, which tortured to madness. This gave him a curious ascendancy over the warm and brilliant natures of Erskine and Sheridan, over whom he seemed to exercise a sort of fascination of terror. We can scarcely conceive an assembly in which there were greater orators than Erskine, Wyndham, Sheridan, Gray, and even Burke, but all contemporaries placed Pitt and Fox on a level apart. This alone enables us to compute their genius, and when we consider their generation and those that preceded, we cannot but arrive at the belief that eloquence and stenography are not of congenial growth, and that in an inverse ratio, as the art of reporting improves, the art of oratory declines. It is said that Pitt did not read much or care to talk about books. It is probable that he had no time to keep abreast of modern literature, though we know that he delighted in Scott. But we possess a graphic account of the little sitting dining room at Hallwood, with the long easy chair on which the weary minister would throw himself, below that hanging shelf of volumes, among which a thumbed and dog-eared Virgil was specially paramount. His rooms at Hallwood and Walmer, says one of his friends, were strewn with Latin and Greek classics. Lord Grenville, a consummate judge, declared that Pitt was the best Greek scholar he ever conversed with. He was, adds Wellesley, as complete a master of all English literature as he undoubtedly was of the English language. He especially loved Shakespeare and Milton, and recited with exquisite feeling the finer passages of Paradise Lost. It is unnecessary to multiply testimony of this kind, but it is also somewhat unexpectedly recorded that he relished the adventures of Telemachus, and especially enjoyed the speeches of the dreary mentor in that too didactic tale. His well-known anxiety to possess a speech of Bolingbroke's seems to have arisen rather from curiosity as to an orator so renowned than from any peculiar admiration of his style. He considered, we are told, Gil Blas the best of all novels. All this does not amount to much. Few prime ministers are able to give much time to literature when in office, especially at a period when an interminable dinner took up all the leisure that could be snatched from work. As an author, he did little. His collected works would scarcely fill a pamphlet. During his last stay at Bath, two of his colleagues committed a crime worthy of the lowest circle of the Inferno by sending him their poems to correct. What perhaps was venial to Canning was unpardonable in Mulgrave, but it shows that he was considered as great an authority in literature as in politics. Of his own poetic faculty, nothing remains but the dubious reputation of having contributed a verse to the University of Göttingen, two couplets which he bestowed on Mulgrave, and of which it suffices to say that they are not to be distinguished from Mulgrave's own, a translation of an ode of Horace, and some lines not less insignificant. They are on the same level as the stanzas which we unluckily possess of Chatham's. In prose, we have only the political articles which he wrote for the anti-Jacobin, of which those on finance in numbers 2, 3, 12, and 25, as well as the review of the session in 35, are by him. At least Canning has so ascribed them, in his own handwriting, in his own copy. He has been loudly blamed for his insensibility to literary merit, so far, at least, as such sensibility is shown by distribution of the funds and patronage of the crown, we do not know what were his principles as to such matters, 
for during his twenty years of government he was, though assailed by Matthias and Montague, never taken to task in Parliament on that subject. This fact, while it deprives us of his explanation, throws so remarkable a light on contemporary opinion as possibly to illustrate his own. If he was convinced that literature like war thrived best upon subsidy, he was culpable indeed. But it is conceivably possible that he may have thought differently. He may have believed that money does not brace but relax the energies of literature, that more Miltons have remained mute and inglorious under the suffocation of wealth than under the frosts of penury, that, in a word, half the best literature of the world has been produced by duns. Pensionless poetry may at least bear comparison with that which has flourished upon bounties. Under the chill rays of Pitt we have Burns, Wordsworth, Cooper, Southey, Scott, Coleridge, Canning, Crabbe, Joanna Bailey, Rogers, and even under the tropical effusion of twelve hundred a year dispensed in heat drops of fifty or a hundred pounds apiece, we have had nothing conspicuously superior. It is not easy at any rate to cite the names of many eminent men of letters who have received material assistance from the state since the time of Pitt. Hook and Moore had reason even to curse the ill-judged bounty of their country, and yet they were provided with lucrative offices. Nothing Pitt may have thought is so difficult as for a parliamentary government to encourage literature. It may begin by encouraging a Shakespeare, but it is far more likely to discover a pie. You start with a genius and end with a job. Apart from these arguments, a more practical and pressing plea can be urged for Pitt. Government then rested largely on patronage. He lived in that respect from hand to mouth, and when he had but half satisfied the demands of politics, there was no surplus for literature. End of section 21《Section 22 of Pitt by Archibald Primrose, Lord Rosebery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15, Part 2, Character and Position of Pitt. His exercise of patronage has been attacked on another point. He is said to have advised the creation of too many peers. He did indeed ennoble with unsparing hands. During the first five years of his ministry, he bestowed 48 peerages. In two subsequent years, 1796 and 1797, he created and promoted 35, and when he resigned in 1801, he created or promoted 140. He nearly, in fact, doubled the peerage as it stood at the accession of George III. This profusion had the strange result that the Reform Bill of 1831 was, it is said, rejected by Mr. Pitt's peerage against those of older creation. Pitt had a triple reason for the excessive bounty. In the first place, the economic measure of reform in the civil list, which had been passed in 1782, had so crippled and confined the patronage of ministers that a profuse creation of peerages was almost the only resource of government as carried on in those days. But his own reductions of this kind were enormous, and with this special distinction. Burke had reduced the patronage of the crown and of ministers. Pitt, as prime minister, labored faithfully and indefatigably to reduce his own. Between 1784 and 1799, he abolished 85 absolute sinecures in the customs, with salaries of from £2,000 a year downwards. He collected a revenue of 12 millions, with 747 fewer officials than it had taken under previous governments to collect a revenue of six. All this was done in the service of the public to make enemies for himself and diminish the opportunities of rewarding his followers and strengthening his government, Conduct of this kind was unique in those days and has not been too common since. He desired, secondly, to recruit and refresh the House by large additions from various classes, 
from the old landed gentry and the commercial banking aristocracy and thirdly it was necessary for the security of his own and any future governments to render impossible combinations of great peers to overset the government he had to destroy the whig oligarchy which had so long wielded a perilous and selfish power it was on this ground that he secured the cordial cooperation of the crown in the creation of peers though to the end of life he called himself a whig a term which it must be remembered was then the only one to describe every shade of what we call liberalism the radicalism of chatham or the selfish oligarchy of the revolution families one thing more must be said on this head which is essential to a right understanding of the subject the main reason which prevailed consciously or unconsciously with pitt in his creation of peers was his disdain of the aristocracy his sympathies his views his policy were all with those middle classes which then represented the idea of the people by a strange accident he became the leader of the nobility but they supported him on their necks for his foot was there they were the puppets through which he conducted the administration of the country but he scorned them and snubbed them and flooded their blue blood with a plentiful adulteration of an inferior element read for example the anguish of the duke of leeds under his treatment read his letters to the brother of cornwallis and the son of chichester both noble bishops discreetly ready for the enlargement of their spiritual opportunities pitt in the aristocracy had not an idea or a sentiment in common his attitude to them resembled the earlier relations of the late lord beaconsfield to the magnates of the party he was willing to give a peerage to any decent possessor of ten thousand a year as for his baronets their name was legion and his knights were as the sand of the sea but he had no sympathy with their sympathies and regarded their aspirations with a sort of puzzled scorn his mission to appease buckingham when that potentate was raging over a distribution of garters from which he was excluded must have been one of the most solemn farces on record for he could not understand the feelings that he had to soothe he considered the peers as his election agents therefore the more the better and as regards their further objects of promotion or decoration he would had he had the power have satisfied them all a minister of this temper may gratify but he is not likely to strengthen an aristocracy to estimate pitt as a statesman to sum up his career to strike his account with history one must take adequate means and scales jauntily to dismiss him as a superannuated prodigy with an account of the reforms he projected and abandoned with a summary record of his loans and gagging acts with a severe gaze at the corruption of the union and the horrors of the irish rebellion with an oblique glance at port wine to consider him a trained liberal who became one of the king's tools and then held power by prerogative in some form or another to regard him as a man infirm of purpose and tenacious only of office is to take a view justified by passages and aspects and incidents of his career but one neither adequate nor comprehensive men will long canvass his claims and merits as a minister for the subject matter is so unparalleled lord beaconsfield for example who delighted in political paradox wrote a letter in eighteen seventy three to sir william harcourt whose kindness affords me the opportunity of printing it which contains his view of pitt i do not at all agree with you in your estimate of pitt's career it is the first half of it which i select as his title deed to be looked upon as a tory minister hostility to borough-mongering economy french alliance and commercial treaties borrowed from the admirable negotiations of utrecht the latter half is pure whiggism close parliaments war with france national debt and commercial restriction all prompted and inspired by the arch-whig trumpeter mr burke these sentences express perhaps rather the light scoff of a bantering spirit 
than the cold results of historical research. But they represent an opinion always worth reading, even when given partly in jest, and one which derives color from the confusion caused by the necessary change between Whiggism and Toryism before and after the sure establishment of the Protestant succession. The various classes of opinion have crystallized, roughly speaking, into two schools of thought. The first, the most common and the least informed, is that which honors Pitt as one who became prime minister at the age of an ensign, who achieved the union with Ireland, and who was the great antagonist of the French Revolution. The other, the more recent and scientific school, is that which severely divides the life of Pitt into two parts, the first embracing his administration up to 1793, which was entirely praiseworthy and which might from its character deserve the commendation of Peel or Cobden, the second the remainder which was entirely and conspicuously blameworthy. It may be permitted to hold aloof from both parties. The one does not sufficiently go into detail, the other draws a distinction which is not natural. If you take two portraits of a man, one at the age of three and the other at three score and ten, you will trace no resemblance whatever between the faces depicted, and yet the change from one to the other is so gradual that there is no one day of his life at which you could say that a man was unlike what he was the day before. As with the natural, so it is with the political man. A politician may make a sudden and complete retraction and so abruptly change his historical aspect, just as an individual may meet with an accident that entirely changes his personal appearance. But putting such catastrophes on one side, it is not possible to draw a line across the life of a statesman with the declaration that all is white on one side and all is black on the other. With Pitt, at any rate, it was the circumstances that changed and not the man. And the circumstances resolved themselves mainly into one, the French Revolution. No man can understand Pitt without saturating himself with the French Revolution and endeavoring to consider it as it must have seemed at its first appearance. In the first five years, he had not to deal with it, and they were fruitful years for England. He found our average imports in 1784 £11,690,000. In 1793, they had risen by seven millions. In the same period, our exports of British merchandise had risen from 10 to 18 millions, and of foreign merchandise from 4,330,000 to 6,000. 560,000 pounds. In December 1783, the three percents stood at 74. In 1792, they stood at over 96. But the new element clouded the whole firmament. It is safe to say that there was not a sane human being then living in Europe so exalted or so obscure or so dull as not to be affected by the French Revolution, except perhaps that traditional Marquis de L'Aigle who snapped his fingers at it and went on hunting at Compiègne without interruption. Was it possible that Pitt, and Pitt alone, should remain heedless and insensible? Was it desirable? We are now able to fix epochs in the French Revolution, to fancy that we can measure its forces, to point out exactly what, in our philosophical opinions, might have modified or turned or arrested it, just as we calculate what would have happened if Hannibal had captured Rome, or as men of powerful imagination have composed eloquent dialogues showing what eminent personages would have said to each other had they happened to meet. It is all cut and dried, a delicate speculation of infinite science and interest, though critical minds may differ as to its value. But Pitt could only perceive the heavens darkened and the sound of a rushing mighty wind that filled all Europe. Seeing and hearing that, he formed perhaps a juster judgment than those who discussed the matter as an elegant question of political balance. 
he saw that uncontrolled it was overwhelming, and he did not pause to reason as to what might be its eventual effect when another century had passed. An earthquake, or the movement of snows surcharged, or the overflow of some swollen river, may cause absolute ruin for the moment and great subsequent benefit. But the philosopher who is speculating on the fifth act will disappear in the first. Pitt faced the cataclysm and made everything subservient to the task of averting it. All reforms were put on one side till the barometer should rise to a more promising level. It is impossible, said Wyndham, to repair one's house in the hurricane season. It is impossible, it may be added, to put Pitt's French Revolution policy in a form more terse and more true. Many may profess to regret that we did not allow full play to the agitation, that we did not sit still to receive what should be prescribed from Paris. They may be right, but those may also be right who, without dogmatizing one way or the other, feel unable to estimate the result of the sudden flow of so fermenting a vintage into the venerable vessel of the British Constitution. It is probable that most people will think that Pitt was right in his forecast of the revolution and in his inability to accept it as a boon for a country of such different conditions. For there was no middle course. The revolution had to be accepted or repelled. But if his view be right, a large latitude must be given for his acts of repression and suspensions of habeas corpus. For the enemy he had to fight was as much subterranean as external. The French fought not less by emissaries than by armies, and so Pitt would say, if the thing had to be done at all, it had to be done with all possible might and main. There could be no refinement as to means, any more than in a storm with much mutiny on board. His case for his repressive acts depends on the reality and extent of the alleged conspiracy. It is common now to think that it was exaggerated. That is always the case with regard to such efforts when they have been baffled. It was so said in the case of Catiline, and so in the case of Thistlewood. What has been rendered abortive, it is common to think, would never have possessed vitality. But it must be remembered that what Pitt did was not a vain imagination of his own, but founded on the solemn, anxious inquisition and report of Parliament itself. It was Parliament that instructed the executive. It was Parliament that ordered repressive measures. It is impossible to carry the matter further than this, and there it must be left. Had he lived now, his career would, of course, have been different. Instead of being a majestic and secluded figure, supreme in the House of Commons, and supported by the direct, incalculable influence of the Crown, he must have looked outside to great democratic constituencies with his finger on their pulse. He would have addressed mass meetings all over the country. He must have lived not so much in Parliament as with the nation outside, in a nation vastly larger than that with which he had to deal. That, however, was not his position, or the position of any minister then, or for long afterwards. He had to deal with powers which we neither know nor understand. On the throne, an active and ardent politician, buying boroughs by the dozen and contributing twelve thousand pounds at each dissolution to the election fund of every minister whom he approved, besides what he might spend at by-elections whose personal party in the House of Commons numbered perhaps a third of that assembly, and whose party in the House of Lords controlled that body. Secondly, he had to deal with the borough mongers, who required to be fed as regularly as the lions at the tower. These are the vanished factors of government. But because he was supported by them, it is not to be supposed that he was not supported by the people, the people were then, politically speaking, the middle classes, and he was the man of the middle classes. When he took office, he did so by the act of the king, but the king was clearly the interpreter of the national will, 
the petitions, the municipal resolutions, the general election clearly proved this, and the nation seems, so far as we can judge by the limited but sole expressions of their will, by elections and by acclamations, to have followed Pitt to the end of his long administration. Wilkes, who was himself no bad test of popular feeling, followed him from the beginning. He had, it is true, the king and the aristocracy with him, but he truckled to neither the one nor the other. Indeed, it is one of his singular merits that he managed to combine into a solid array of support king, lords, and people. But it is no real charge against him that he utilized as an aid the king and the aristocracy, for there was no possible government without them. Nor when the Whigs succeeded him did they dream of introducing any other system. They only complained that the king withheld his election contribution from them. It is perhaps unnecessary to say more of the circumstances and surroundings of Pitt, but it is impossible to complete any sketch of his career or indeed to form an adequate estimate of his character without setting him, if only for a moment, by the side of Chatham. Not merely are they father and son. Not merely are they the most conspicuous English ministers of the 18th century, but their characters illustrate each other. And yet it is impossible for men to be more different. Pitt was endowed with mental powers of the first order. His readiness, his apprehension, his resource were extraordinary. The daily parliamentary demand on his brain and nerve power he met with serene and inexhaustible affluence. His industry, administrative activity, and public spirit were unrivaled. It was perhaps impossible to carry the force of sheer ability further. He was a portent. Chatham, in most of these respects, was inferior to his son. He was incalculable, sometimes sublime, sometimes impossible, and sometimes insane, but he had genius. It was that fitful and undefinable inspiration that gave to his eloquence a piercing and terrible note, which no other English eloquence has touched, that made him the idol of his countrymen, though they could scarcely be said to have seen his face or heard his voice or read his speeches, that made him a watchword among those distant insurgents whose wish for independence he yet ardently opposed, that made each remotest soldier and bluejacket feel when he was in office that there was a man in Downing Street and a man whose eye penetrated everywhere, that made his name at once an inspiration and a dread, that cowed the tumultuous commons at his frown. Each pit possessed in an eminent degree the qualities which the other most lacked. One was formed by nature for peace, the other for war. Chatham could not have filled Pitt's place in the ten years which followed 1783, but from the time that war was declared the guidance of Chatham would have been worth an army. No country could have too many pits. The more she has, the greater will she be. But no country could afford the costly and splendid luxury of many Chathams. To sum up, it is not claimed that Pitt was a perfect character or a perfect statesman. Such monsters do not exist. But it may be confidently asserted that few statesmen and few characters could bear so close a scrutiny. He erred, of course, but it is difficult to find any act of his career which cannot be justified by solid and in most cases by convincing reasons. It may be said that his party acted more on him than he on them, but the relations of a successful leader with his party are so subtle that it is difficult to distinguish how much he gives and how much he receives. It is no doubt true that the changed conditions of the world compelled him to give up his first task of educating his followers and to appeal rather to their natural instincts or prejudices. It may be alleged that he clung to office. This is said of every minister who remains long in power. Office is indeed an acquired taste, though by habit persons may learn to relish it, just as men learn to love absinthe or opium or cod liver oil. 
but the three years which Pitt spent out of place and almost out of Parliament seemed to have been the happiest of his life, and his resignation was generally condemned as groundless and wanton. It may, however, be conceded that unconsciously he may have become inured to office, and that, as leaving it implies at any rate a momentary defeat, he may have been unwilling to face this. Men who pine for unofficial repose dread the painful process of quitting office, the triumph of enemies and the discomfiture of friends and the wrench of habit, as men weary of life fear the actual process of death. It may also be said that, though he generally saw what was right, he did not always ensue it. What minister has or can? He has to deal not with angels, but with men, with passions, prejudices, and interests, often sordid or misguided. He must, therefore, compromise the ideal, and do not the best, but the nearest practicable to the best. But let us remember what is indisputable. No one suspected his honesty. No one doubted his capacity. No one impeached his aims. He had, as Canning said, qualities rare in their separate excellence, wonderful in their combination. And these qualities were inspired by a single purpose. I am no worshipper of Mr. Pitt, said Wilberforce in the House of Commons, long after Pitt's death. But if I know anything of that great man, I am sure of this, that every other consideration was absorbed in one great ruling passion, the love of his country. It was this that sustained him through all, for he ruled during the convulsion of a new birth at the greatest epoch in history since the coming of Christ, and was on the whole not unequal to it. There let us leave him. Let others quarrel over the details. From the dead eighteenth century his figure still faces us with a majesty of loneliness and courage. There may have been men both abler and greater than he, though it is not easy to cite them. But in all history there is no more patriotic spirit, none more intrepid, and none more pure. End of section 22 Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, May 2016 End of Pitt by Archibald Primrose Lord Rosebery.